Hello, I'm Professor John Kelly and this is the Weber Auto YouTube channel. In this episode, the third episode on the Mustang Mach-E GT that we have, uh, we are going to remove the high voltage battery. So in the first video that I made, I showed you all the high voltage components on this vehicle. In the second video I made, I showed you how to disable or de-energize the high voltage system. So now that it's de-energized, it's time to remove the battery and we will take the cover off and look inside and look at the contactors and other parts uh, and show you some what's serviceable and what's not uh, inside the battery. Now, to <laughs> lift this vehicle to get the battery out, there's some special adapters that have to be installed. And if you look at this photograph right here, you can see uh, these four adapters that have to be bolted on under the vehicle. And then the, uh, that allows the hoist to come in and lift on those adapters rather than the normal lifting points, which are actually on the battery uh, housing frame. So to install these adapters, you actually have to remove what are called the rocker panels, this big long panel that goes under both side doors here on each side because this is in the way of installing the adapters that you need to install to lift the vehicle to remove the battery. So these are really a pain to get off. There's a bunch of little tiny clips. There's a key fob antenna you have to be careful and, and undo. But we've got all, <laughs> we've got both sides removed. We've got the, all the special adapters installed. Yeah. It's very difficult to position the vehicle properly to use the adapters with your hoist. You've got to be able to move the vehicle forward and backward uh, and even side to side uh, as we found out. And so it, y you need somebody to be able to move the, the car in and out while somebody else watches the hoist lift points. But even then you've got to be able to sometimes move, make some fine adjustments in the position of the vehicle. There's a procedure in the owner's manual to put the vehicle in neutral and let it stay there for up to 30 minutes before it automatically goes back to park. The rear drive unit and electric motor in this Mustang has a physical parking gear and physical parking pawl that is electrically actuated. If you look at this photograph here, you can see the parking gear and the parking pawl. So we need to put the vehicle in neutral to be able to position the vehicle on the hoist and then to keep it from re-engaging, uh, we need to disconnect the 12 volt battery. So in the previous video on de-energizing the high voltage system, we did not disconnect the 12 volt battery. We needed the 12 volt system operating so that we could have the battery energy control module, the battery computer, monitor the high voltages to verify that we were actually depowered or high voltage system disabled. But now, since we're removing the, the battery totally and we need to be able to stay in neutral, uh, we are going to disconnect the 12 volt battery negative cable and that will also depower the battery energy control module, the computer inside of the battery that monitors all the voltages and, and the contactors and so on. So our next step now is to disconnect that 12 volt battery. The service information actually tells us to disconnect this stud right here. This is the negative cable coming off of the negative post of the 12 volt battery. But there's this big brace in the way that keeps the cable from coming up and clearing. Uh, I've tried to do it and it creates an arc flash when I try to take it off because there's a little tab that holds it in place. So I'm taking off the actual battery cable clamp at the battery itself. I've already loosened the nut and I'm just going to lift it up and off. We'll get it out of the way here so that it doesn't go back to touching the 12 volt system. So our drive unit would be in neutral and now it would stay in neutral instead of defaulting back to park after 30 minutes, allowing us to reposition the vehicle on the hoist as necessary to lift it. Okay, under the vehicle, there are these giant panels for aerodynamics and 
for protecting the high voltage uh, connections and other pieces that are under the vehicle. And I've already removed these for the previous two videos. I've had some people comment uh, on YouTube here that they were surprised there was nothing covering up those connectors. There is something covering it up. There's one on the front, there's one on the rear that makes the whole underbody of the Mustang uh, nice and smooth. So now our next step is to actually lift the vehicle up and disconnect the coolant hoses. There's four coolant hoses at the front of the battery and two at the rear and drain that coolant into a suitable container. The two coolant hoses at the rear of the battery are not for the battery itself. They are just coolant hoses for the rear inverter and drive unit. Those coolant hoses uh, have a special twist lock system to disconnect them. Uh, it's actually called the Twist 2 Quick Connector from a, from a company called the Norma Group. And if you look at this uh, drawing from their website, it shows you how to switch these twist connectors to the unlocked position and then pull the hose and pipe apart. Uh, there's no squeezing. Uh, you don't have to push anything. You just twist this locking tab and then pull the hose out. When I first saw these in the Ford service information, there were no instructions on how to disconnect them. And it took me, took me quite a while of fighting it before I finally gave up and just took a, a close-up photograph of the connector and got the, the name of the company that made it and looked up the sheet on how to disconnect it. So maybe I missed the instructions in, in the Ford service information, but I finally figured it out. So those two connectors are coming off right now, and that'll allow us to drain some of the coolant. Okay, this photograph is of the connector locked, and this photograph is of the connector unlocked. Okay, I was able to remove five of the six coolant hoses. The, I got all four disconnected at the front of the battery, but only one disconnected at the rear. Um, there's just a real tight space in there, and I can't get my giant hands in there to <laughs> disconnect it. So I will wait until we get to the point where we lower the battery a few inches, and that will give me some more space to disconnect that hose. It does have a little bit of play in there, so I'm not worried about damaging anything. But for some reason, I just can't get a good grip and, and uh, get that hose connection disconnected. All right, so our next step is to disconnect the electrical connectors on the battery, the high-voltage electrical connectors and the low-voltage electrical connector. We will start on the rear electrical connector of the battery, which provides power to the rear inverter for the rear drive unit, the rear electric motor. Okay, here at the back of the battery, we have the electrical connector that goes to the inverter. There are two studs with nuts that hold the harness in place. I've got to take those off. For those of you that are thinking he's not wearing any personal protective equipment or high voltage gloves, Remember that the de-energizing procedure that I did in the previous video verified that we don't have any voltage on these wires. So now there is a red connector position assurance clip right here. We're just going to pull that down just like that. And then we're going to take this black lever and rock it out and towards the driver's side of the vehicle, just like that. It pulls out on this connector. This connector is from TE Connectivity. It is the exact same connector used on the Tesla Model 3 and Model Y on their uh, drive units and battery connection. So we will disconnect that and get that out of the way. I forgot to mention one important thing in relation to these high voltage connectors, the removal of these connectors. This is a brand new car and everything's, everything is nice and clean. But once these cars start being driven on the road, there can be dirt and, and grime buildup on the outside of those electrical connectors. 
and you are supposed to go in and clean off the connector housing so that when you disconnect it, we don't get dirt and whatever else falling down inside of the electrical connectors and possibly damaging the weather tight seals uh, that they have on them. So let's take those front connectors off. Okay, there's a very specific order in which we disconnect these electrical connectors. The first one is this low voltage electrical connector here that contains our CAN data lines, our power and ground for the uh, battery energy uh, control module, the battery computer inside, and various other uh, signals. So we have this red connector position assurance clip. We're going to pull that out. Then we push in on this black tab right here and rock this gray lever towards the front of the car. So we push in and rock out. As it rocks out, it unplugs the electrical connector. So that now has disconnected all our low voltage connections. All right, the next one after that, let me get that out of the way, is our front inverter connector, this silver one right here. So it has a 10 millimeter bolt holding it in and it forces you to slowly disconnect this connector, which is actually a good thing because if there were stuck shut contactors, it's possible if something were left on, which there shouldn't be when you turn the car off and everything else shuts off, uh, if something were left on and we had current coming through these wires, then you could have an, uh, what's called a DC arc flash. And there's several videos on YouTube on DC arc flash uh, for you to look at, but you disconnect that bolt. It, the bolt does not come out, it's a captured bolt. And then we unplug that electrical connector from the inverter output terminals there. Those two terminals are the two terminals that connect right through our positive contactor and negative contactor. All right, our next electrical connector is this one over here, and that's for AC level one and AC level two charging. Uh, when you plug the charge cord into your car, there's an onboard charge module under the inverter that changes it to DC and provides that power here on this electrical connector to charge the battery through some pretty small wires. So there's a blue connector position assurance clip right here. We're gonna slide that forward and then we're gonna press on this tab right there and back off on that electrical connector. By the way, this electrical connector, notice has four wires connected to it. It has two wires coming in and two wires going out. And that makes a connection with other high voltage components up underneath the hood there. All right, our very last high voltage electrical connector is this one right here for our DC fast charging. Now the DC fast charger has its own set of contactors, positive and negative, and they can have their own trouble codes for being stuck shut or stuck open. And so uh, we've already verified that through the disabling procedure that we have low voltage on this connector. So there's a red connector position assurance clip right here. We're just gonna slide it over towards the passenger side and then rock down a black, electro, or black lever which unplugs the DC fast charge electrical connector here. And there we go. All right, so once again, those of you who are surprised that I'm using bare hands here, it's okay to use bare hands if you have verified that you have low voltage or no voltage on these, these wires. And that's the whole point of the verification process with the scan tool. Now, if that failed or you had diagnostic trouble codes for stuck shut contactors or even suspected stuck shut contactors, then you need to be wearing high voltage personal protective equipment like these gloves with outer uh, leather protectors and using a multimeter to verify that you do or don't have high voltage on these connectors. Okay, we have all of the electrical connectors disconnected on this high voltage battery. 
So now our next step is to bring in our battery lift table and get it positioned at the center of gravity on this battery. Um, this battery, is you don't put it in the middle because the, there's a heavy section in the rear on the extended range battery. Um, the normal battery, their, their standard range battery, it might be in the middle, but you've got to really be careful. Uh, the battery lift table that I'm using is not the official Ford one. The official Ford one has a little bit bigger of a tabletop to set the battery on, which I really like. Um, we're going to build a bigger tabletop for our lift here uh, to use. So uh, we're going to get that positioned up under the, the center of gravity mark. I've taken an orange paint marker and made a little X, as you can see in this photograph, where I think the center of gravity is. And we've had this battery out several times, and it's been balanced just fine at that point. So we'll get that up in there, and then we'll take all the bolts out and start lowering it down. But remember, we still have one coolant hose I couldn't get disconnected, so we can't lower it too far without getting that disconnected first. Okay, here comes our battery lift table. This particular one is made by OTC. It's part number 1595, and it is a powertrain lift with a maximum capacity of 2,500 pounds. Uh, I found out that this battery, the extended range battery on this Mustang, weighs 600 kilograms, which is a little over 1,300 pounds. So we're well within the limits on this lift. This is an electric lift. So I gotta plug in a power cord to run the pump. All right, the lift isn't quite positioned perfectly, but I'm gonna take it up before I fine tune it. Gotta come forward a little bit and to the side, driver's side a little bit. That looks pretty good from this angle. Let's see what the other angle looks like. Back end still needs to come over a little bit. All right, let's check that. A little bit too far. Now back towards the passenger side. There we go. All right, that looks like that's right where we want it. Uh, this lift table adjusts. Uh, it pivots left and right and front and back if we need to, to make any adjustments. But let's take it up to where it contacts the battery. Right there. All right, we've contacted the battery. We've got a good solid connection there. And now we can start taking out the bolts. 16 bolts on each side and then eight in the rear. So the first bolts the service manual tells us to remove are actually the eight nuts on the back of the battery on some studs. Okay, there are two torque to yield bolts that are not reusable, they stretch. Um, they're tightened to a certain torque and then a certain angle after that, torque to yield, that need to be replaced if you take a battery down and put it back in. Um, we are going to replace these 
uh, here in a few weeks when we put the car back together for actual driving on the road. We're actually going to use this for recruiting uh, here at our uh, automotive department. And so uh, we've been just reusing the bolts uh, in my boot camp classes and, uh, and my regular college classes, but uh, it wasn't ever being driven. So uh, torque to yield bolts need to be replaced. All right, the other bolts that hold the battery in on the sides, they also say to replace them, but they are not torque to yield bolts. But they do have a special head right here on the back that digs into the aluminum housing. And I suspect that they want these bolts replaced because the little parts here on the bolt head uh, probably get dull. They dull themselves uh, with repeated use. Uh, I don't know for sure. If any of you know, let me know. But uh, these bolts need to be replaced also. So we've got all the bolts out of the high voltage battery now. I'm, I am covered with metal flakes from those locking, digging in bolts that dig into the uh, frame of the battery housing. Uh, if you take a look at this photograph here, you can see uh, where it digs in. Uh, so repeated removal and, and installation is eventually going to wear a hole right through it. Um, we're thinking of putting some flat washers on there for our school use in classes so that we don't keep digging into the housing. So our next step is to lower the battery. And remember, I've got one more, elect or one more coolant connector I need to disconnect at the back of the battery. And then we can lower it down the rest of the way and get it out here and get the cover off of it and look at the contactors and other parts. Okay, the first thing I do when I lower the battery is to lower it just a little bit and see if it looks like it's balanced. And it does, it, it's, it's balanced here. If it wasn't balanced, I've got a, some rent, a wrench here ready to make the adjustment, but we are definitely uh, sitting balanced there. Our coolant hose is coming down. Let's come down a little bit more. I need to check the front to make sure that we don't have any electrical connectors grabbing that could tip the battery off of the table. Good and free, free, free. Coolant hoses are all out of the way. Looks good. All right, I'm going to see if I can get this coolant connector disconnected now that I can get to it. It's normally not this hard to, to remove. I don't understand why it's giving me such grief. These coolant connectors, you don't twist anything except for the little gray lock. If you twist the pipe versus the main connector housing, uh, things can get out of alignment, and I think maybe that's what's happened here. Okay, I still can't get that coolant hose disconnected. Um, there's uh, maybe some damage inside from, from something, but the coolant tubes that it connects to are attached to the outer battery cover, the top cover of the, of the battery housing. And there's just some little Christmas tree plugs that hold that in. So as I lower the battery down, I'm going to disconnect that and leave it connected until I can deal with it a little bit later. But at least it will be able to get this battery down and out of the way. All right, coming down a little more. Good. Looks good up here. OK, 
Okay, coming down some more. Ah, finally. All right. Got the stupid coolant hose. <laughs> so I finally got that coolant hose disconnected. Uh, somebody did twist the connector a little bit too much. Uh, well, they twisted the whole housing rather than just the lock. And that's what was throwing me off. So these normally just come undone easily, but this one was a fighter. All right, let's bring the battery down the rest of the way. Here it comes. Looks good, we'll keep going. Get my wrench off of there. All right, we'll bring it down the rest of the way. Right there. Okay, as you can see, we have the high voltage battery lowered down <laughs> out of this uh, vehicle after fighting that stupid coolant hose. But um, the next step is to get it out from underneath the vehicle and take the cover bolts off so that we can see inside of the battery. Okay, now that we have the battery removed from the vehicle, if you were switching the battery or changing the battery to a different one, you will need a battery lifting fixture. And Ford sells this one for the, for the Mustang and it works with other Ford uh, vehicles also. But it has this big I-beam lifting bar and these uh, lifting straps and, and eye bolts that you put in in specific positions. And then lift it off of our battery lifting tool that we use to lower it from the vehicle and put it into the shipping box or get the one out of the shipping box and swap them back and forth. Uh, this battery weighing 600 kilograms or 1300 pounds uh, is very heavy and uh, we've got a overhead crane here in the shop so we can lift this up. So we can lift the battery, we can get the, the rolling lift out from underneath it, we can set it on the floor, we can get the other one out of the box and swap it and so on. But this same lifting tool is also used when we go inside the battery. When we take the battery cover off, which we're going to do next, and get in there and look at the contactors and the battery modules and sections and so on, uh, we can lift out two battery modules at a time with this same lifting fixture and some different adapters. So I'm going to set the battery back down on the lifting table and take these straps off and get the cover bolts out and then we'll lift the cover off and take a look inside. I have to verify that it is centered on the lifting table before I take the straps off. And yes, we're in good shape. So we can let this down and get these straps off. Take that 
lifting fixture out of the way for the moment. Okay, there are a whole bunch of seven millimeter head bolts that we're going to take out all the way around this battery cover. There are 64 bolts. There is not a specific order in which you remove them. So I'm just going to go around in a circle and take them out. Okay, we've got all the battery bolts out. Uh, before I lift this battery cover off, there's one battery vent that I want to call your attention to. Right here. This vent is a special material. I believe it is Gore-Tex uh, material. It allows for atmospheric pressure change as you change elevation. Um, it does not let moisture, or dust, or dirt get inside the battery. This battery housing being mounted under the vehicle needs to be hermetically sealed, which means that it has a really good seal to prevent moisture intrusion, especially that could cause problems inside the battery, specifically loss of high voltage isolation, corrosion and, and other problems. So uh, these are sealed containers under your vehicle. When the battery goes back together, when we put the cover back on, there is a leak check that needs to be performed to make sure that it is still sealed when it's put back in the vehicle. All right, I'm going to get someone to help me lift the cover off. Uh, when we lift the cover off, we must have our high voltage personal protective equipment on uh, because now we are dealing with high voltages inside the battery. And as we lift the cover off, there's a possibility that you could slip and fall and put your hand inside or hands inside and possibly touch something that you should not. Let's take it over uh, by those shelves. As you can see, we have the battery cover removed. Now inside of this extended range battery, we have 12 battery modules. This is one battery module right here. This is actually battery module number 12. That's number one, two, three, four, five in the bottom on the lower level, six in the back on the upper level, seven on the top on the on my side, and then eight below it, nine, 10, 11, and 12. The regular range or the standard range battery does not have the upper level in the back there. The whole battery is flat and smooth, as you can see in this photograph of a standard range battery. But this battery uh, is the extended range. And what they did to make it extended range uh, is to increase the amp hour rating of the of this battery. This battery only has 94 cell groups of 3.7 volt lithium ion battery cells in series with each other, which gives us a nominal voltage of 347.8 volts. The standard range battery has 96 3.7 volt cells in series with each other, which gives 355.2 volts. However, this, even though the voltage is lower on this extended range battery, it has a higher amp hour rating. So as I said, there are 94 cell packs in this battery at 3.7 volts each. Within each cell pack, this battery has four parallel cells that give it a amp hour rating of around 273 amp hours, which is pretty impressive. That's how you get your longer driving range and uh, your better performance. The standard range battery only has three pouch cells in parallel for each of its 96 rather than 94 um, cell groups. And so even though <laughs> This looks like it has more battery cells in it. It doesn't, it has less. 
It just has more parallel cell groups. So we put batteries, battery cells in series with each other to increase the voltage. We put them in parallel with each other to increase the amp hour rating. And this has a high amp hour rating. It's right up there with our Tesla Model S. This is actually a, a very impressive uh, battery. It's rated at 98.8 kilowatts. Right here in the front of the battery is the battery junction box. And it has five contactors in it. These round white pieces here are the high voltage contactors. Two of them, I believe, but I haven't verified yet. The two outside ones are for connecting the high voltage battery positive terminal, which is this one, and negative terminal, which is this one, to our two wire electrical connector going to the inverter uh, at the front of the battery and our two wire electrical connector in the rear going to the rear inverter. The two inside large contactors, I believe, are for the DC fast charging. And I'm going to actually remove this junction box and, and trace the circuits and activate these uh, contactors just to play with them. But our DC fast charge connector is right here. That makes sense that it would be connected to those two inside contactors. Now there's a third contactor called a pre-charge contactor and there's a pre-charge resistor that goes with that that is used in conjunction with powering on the vehicle. It, it physically decreases the amount of current that rushes into the inverters. There's a big capacitor in the inverters. Uh, we don't want to charge that capacitor too quickly. Uh, the current could be really high and cause damage, and so we run it through a pre-charge resistor to slow it down and we do that with a pre-charge contactor. So I'm going to remove this uh, battery junction box with the contactors uh, in the next video. Now, e back to these battery modules. Each battery module has its own positive terminal and its own negative terminal. So positive, negative. If I put a voltmeter from here to here, would read right around 26 volts. Uh, if each battery cell which it has seven battery cells of 3.7 volts each nominal, which means kind of in the, in the middle there, it's neither charged nor discharged. Uh, it would read 20, 26 volts, not dangerous from here to here. But then we connect its negative to the positive of the next one, the next module. And the, the two modules in the front are smaller. They only have seven sets of parallel cells each. The rest of these have eight sets. So the rest of these are right around 30 volts a piece. So we put them in series like flashlight batteries. Positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, all the way through until we get close to our 350 volts or 347, whatever it was, with the uh, 94 cells that we have here. We'll take a look in, in, greater, de at, in greater detail at the battery junction box and we will remove two of these modules with this special holding fixture uh, at the same time and take a look at the cooling system in the next video as well. All right, one last thing to get this video finished up. Let's just go to the back of the battery. All right, here at the back of the battery, we have the battery energy control module. And it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten electrical connectors connected to it. Uh, these ones that have the orange wire coverings on them are the individual circuits that monitor each cell pack or cell group's voltage. We can monitor each cell group's voltage on a scan tool, and we do it through these individual wires and the computer here. There's also some low voltage connections here uh, with the black wire harness covering that would be our power and ground, our CAN communication lines, our contactor controls and so on. Um, there is a very specific order in which you disconnect these connectors if you're ever going to disconnect these or change the BECM. Um, also, if you're going to change this BECM, you should have used a scan tool to capture the programming that it had in it so that you can put that into the new replacement uh, BECM. All right, well, We've removed the battery from the vehicle. We've taken a quick look at the insides of the battery 
In the next video, we'll go into more details of what's inside here. But for now, if this video is long enough. Uh, let's call it quits for, for today, and we'll have a new video coming up soon on the rest of this. Thank you for watching, and have a good day.